Shalomam. Kahun laimla. Yahav Bahashim. Yahav Shai Bahashim. Rukal Kadash. All praises be to the Most High. Yahweh, in the name of His Son, and our Lord and Savior, Yahweh Shai. Much respect and honor to the brothers that are doing the work in truth and sincerity, risking their lives and freedom to do so, pushing this gospel throughout the four corners of the earth. Salutations to the hopeful elect that is scattered abroad in double honors and respect to the elders and the apostles of Great Millstone. Coming back at you with another lesson the Ark of the Covenant. So that Ark of the Covenant was a symbol of a contract being made with the children of Israel. And in the ancient world, the Ark of the Covenant dwelled within the priesthood, the Levites. So they were the custodians of the Ark of the Covenant. But going into the kingdom, we all are going to be kings and priests under the new covenant in the kingdom. So the Ark of the Covenant, the Spirit of the Lord, his tabernacle is with men. Let's go ahead and get that. Go to Revelations 21, verse 6. So he's going to dwell in the midst of Israel. Yahweh Shai, an extension of the Most High. Let's go to, <coughs> excuse me. Revelations 21. Right here. Revelations 21, verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their power. So again, in the old days, the Levite priests were the custodians of the Ark of the Covenant. And when the men of Israel went to war, the Ark of the Covenant moved with the armies of Israel. And no nation was able to take down Israel in those days. Because the Spirit of the Lord was with us. Let's go here. Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Testimony or the Ark of God is the most sacred relic of the Israelites. It consisted of pure gold pure gold-covered wooden chest with an elaborate lid called the mercy seat. The ark is described in the book of Exodus as containing the two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. Now, if you're in the spirit, that mercy seat is Yahweh Shai. So he's going to occupy the throne on earth. So his tabernacle is going to be with the sons of Jacob, kings and priests. The ark is described in the book of Exodus as containing the two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. <coughs> what is that? The word. So the word made flesh is the spirit of the Lord the breath of the Most High, which is Yahweh Shai. 
And there is speculation that the Ark of the Covenant is somewhere on Mount Sinai. The Saudi Arabians have put a banner and a gate around that area. Why? Because everybody that goes in, they die. They don't come out. They've sent in military, helicopters, planes. Nobody makes it in alive. So the Saudis just said, hell with this. We're just going to put up a security gate and a sign sent and a sign which states, do not enter. And on the top of Mount Sinai, it's burnt. For the spirit of the Lord, his presence descended there to talk with Moses. So the Bible is a true book. And many of these other nations know who we are. See, the stone, the book of Exodus as containing the two tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments. So that's the word. So that mercy seat is our Lord and Savior. Go here. Don't want to make this long. I'm going to go to Exodus 25. Oh, by the way, I can't remember which version it is, but in one of the episodes of Raiders of the Lost Ark, remember the German soldiers? It was around World War I time, somewhere around 1915. The German soldiers tried to open the Ark of the Covenant. They all died. See? So listen, Esau Edom knows the truth. Part of it. They don't know the whole truth, but they have the relics, ancient artifacts, where they're able to fund and establish charters, multi-million dollar charters, to go and dig relics and artifacts. So they don't have faith but they have the money and time. So they know the Bible is a true book. And they showed it in that episode of the movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark. When they opened the uh, Ark of the Covenant, all the soldiers turned into skeletons. So they know the Bible is a true book. And why did they die? Because the Most High's Ark or his covenant is only for the Israelites. Let's go to Exodus 25. Exodus 25, verse 18. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold of beaten work. Shall thou make them and the two ends of the mercy seat and make one cherub on the one end and the other cherub on the other end, even of the mercy seat, shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. So that mercy seat, let's go to Hebrews. Chapter, I think it's chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. One moment. Let me go right to it. Oh, nine and five, excuse me. Hebrews chapter nine. Let's go up to verse one. Then verify the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. 
for there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest, the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod budded and the tables of the covenant. So who is that manna sent from heaven? It's Yahawashai. Yahawashai, I think it's John chapter 6. Here we go. John chapter 6, verse 58. Let's go to verse 57. As the living Father hath, as the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. So this is consuming the breath of life. The word made flesh. Verse 58. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Let's go to verse 31. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and give life unto the world. Verse 35. And Yahweh said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So the embodiment of the Ark of the Covenant is our mediator, Yahweh Shai. That's why whenever Israel went to war, he fought for us, the angel of the Lord. Hebrews 9, verse 5. This is the key point. And over it, the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. So Yahweh Shai is our horn of glory. Through him we get mercy. And he's going to occupy the throne of King David. Let's go back. Exodus 25, verse 19. And make one cherub. No, nope, back to 18. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them, and the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end, and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims of the two ends thereof. Let's go back to the image. So these cherubims are angels. So this is the emblem of the marriage contract that the Lord made with Israel. And we're going to find out that his covenant is not for any other nation. Let's go to Leviticus 16. Got to go up to verse 9. Leviticus 16. Verse 9, and Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. So this is 
a blood sacrifice. The Most High deals with blood payment. Verse 10. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. So who is our atonement for sins? That's an easy answer. Yahweh Shai is our blood sacrifice. Let's go into that word. Make sure I click on the right word. Atonement. Okay, here we go. Atonement. Strong's H3722. Kafer. Kafer. Atonement. To cleanse. Disannul. Forgive. Be merciful. So Yahweh Shai is our sacrificial lamb. See the second Peter one and nineteen. Let's see. <clears throat> Second Peter one. Let's try first Peter. A moment. First Peter one, verse 19. Let's go to verse 18. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Hamashiach as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So when he walked the earth as Yahweh Shai, he was perfect without sin, without iniquity. Leviticus 16, verse 10. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. So the priest, the Levitical priest, had to be cleansed first by the blood sacrifice. Verse 12, and he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense beaten small, and bring it within the veil. Let's go down to verse 14. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward, and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. So we're getting the blood sacrifice. Through the blood sacrifice, we're getting an atonement for sins. Mercy. 
sprinkled with the blood of our Lord and Savior. So this is a precursor or a foreshadowing of things to come. So the Bible says that whatsoever was written aforetime was written for our learning. So we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 9. Go to Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. Yeah, let's start at verse 10. which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Let's keep going. But Hamashiach being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. This is to say, not of this spiritual, uh, not of this building. So this new sacrifice is a more sure, perfect sacrifice. A spiritual atonement through the Hamashiach, the Messiah. So this is the temple of the Lord that the sacrifices are being made within. And he dwells within the house of Israel, which starts with his elect. Verse 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifying to the purifying of the flesh. So this was a more carnal sprinkling. A physical sprinkling of blood of bulls and goats. Lambs. But now we have a spiritual washing by the blood. Matter of fact, let's get that. Revelations 1, verse 5. Let's go ahead and go to it. Revelations 1, because we got to go up. Revelations 1, verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Yahawashai Hamashiach, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So this is a perfect spiritual sacrifice through Yahawashai. Let's go to Revelation 7, verse 13. Revelation 7, verse 13. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, 
and he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So this is not literally being doused with blood, but our sins are being purged by a perfect sacrifice without spot or blemish. So when he walked the earth, he was perfect. Yahweh Shai. Let's go back to Hebrews. So the Ark of the Covenant reverts back to the marriage contract between the Most High, the husband, and the daughter of Zion, Israel. And Yahweh Shai is the mediator, a husbandman. Hebrews 9, verse 11, but Hamashiach being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. So this tabernacle of those that are worshiping him in spirit and in truth, not in a physical building or a carnal flesh. Verse 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Hamashiach, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So this is being sprinkled spiritually. Let's go to uh, Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36. So this is a more sure perfect sacrifice. And in the kingdom, we're going to be made perfect. Let's go to Ezekiel 36. Let's go to verse 20. And when they entered unto the heathen, whither they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said to them, these are the people of the Lord and are gone forth out of his land. But I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. So the name of the Lord being profaned, being covered with filthy abominations. Verse 22. Therefore, Say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither ye went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. So to be sanctified means to be washed. So we're being washed by a pure doctrinal truth and through the blood of the Lamb, Yahweh Shai. Verse 24. Verse 24. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols 
or like cleanse you. See, so this perfect baptism by fire is cleansing or purging our conscience, purging our mind. So this is a spiritual baptism or we're being made perfect. See, let's go down to verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away a stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. So this is being made perfect. This is the kingdom of heaven where we will no longer need to be taught the law, statutes, and commandments. So this is a perfect washing, a perfect cleansing, a spiritual renewal. So when we go back to Hebrews 9, nothing gets better than Yahweh Shai, not of goats or lambs. So now we have a more sure sacrifice. Verse 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifying to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Hamashiach, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to the most high, purge your conscience from dead words to serve the living God. So we will no longer, we will no longer go off again. So Yahweh Shai is a perfect sacrifice. Better than goats, bullocks or bulls, lambs, rams. See, that's why we read this, Leviticus 16, Leviticus 16, verse 14. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward, and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Seven represent completion. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and all their sins. And so shall he dip for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. So this washing by the word is only for Israel. That's why the other nations cannot, they have no part in this, no part in the Ark of the Covenant. Let's go down to verse 19. And he shall sprinkle the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hollow it and hollow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. So what part do other nations have in this? 
nothing. Zero. See? So that Ark of the Covenant is the symbol of the agreement or marriage contract with the Israelites and none else. 1 Samuel 5, verse 7. And when the men of Ashdod, wait a minute, we don't need to go there first. Go to verse 4. 1 Samuel 4, verse 3. We got to go to verse 2. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines and they slew of the army in the field about 30,000 men. So the Israelites lost to the Philistines. Why? Because we went off. So this goes back. We got to go to... Uh, Chapter 3. I think somewhere around verse 11. Let's go to right here. 1 Samuel 3, verse 11. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I would do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of every one that heareth it shall tingle. And that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vow and he restrained them not. So this is judgment of rebellious sons of Israel. And in this case, Eli going off and forsaking the commandments of the Lord. Let's go back to 1 Samuel 4 verse 2. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel when they joined battle. Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew of the army in the field about 30,000 men. And when the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore have the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. So the Ark of the Covenant helped to provide a protective hedge where the enemies of Israel were destroyed normally unless we went off but we forsook the Holy Covenant. And notice the Ark of the Covenant out of Shiloh. Shiloh means peace or peaceable, which reverts back to the peaceable one, which reverts back to Yahweh Shai. Verse 3 again. And when the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. So these Philistines are arch enemies of Israel, descendants of Ham. And if I'm not mistaken, these Philistines are also descendants of Mizraim. And they were called the Egyptians. Let's keep going to verse 4. 
So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from thence the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Benefaz, and there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was into the camp. So when the Lord was with Israel, no nation could stand against us. Not the sons of Ham, not the Hebrew Edomites, no nation. So they became nervous, scared. And the Philistines were afraid. For they said, God is come into the camp. And they said, woe unto us, for there have not been such a thing heretofore. Woe unto us. Who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. So they heard of the fame of the Israelites and the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So the enemies of Israel, the descendants of Ham, were terrified, terrified. Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Be strong and quit yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews, as they have been to you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. So they decided to fight anyway, despite knowing the reputation of the spirit of Yahweh Shem Yahweh being with the Hebrews, the Israelites. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten, and they fled every man into his tent. And there was a very great slaughter, for there fell of Israel 30,000 men. Why? because the sons of Eli went off. Eli went off. So when we sin against the Lord, we became an easy prey. Why you think Esau Edom teach? The law, statutes, and commandments are done away with. So we can stay at the bottom and continue to get a Hebrew Edomite boot, a boot, kick into our rear end or our backside. And the ark of the Most High was taken and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinephas. So the ark of the covenant was taken by the enemies of Israel. Is this just a thing? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing or is it just a thing? So what happens when the Ark of the Covenant is taken by the enemies of Israel? What happens when they take the Lord's agreement into their own hands? Let's see. Let's go back to that. 1 Samuel 4. Right here. First Samuel 4, verse 17. And the messenger answered and said, Israel is fled before the Philistines, and there have been also a great slaughter among the people. 
and thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinephas, are dead, and the ark of the Most High is taken. So the ark of the covenant fell into the hands of our enemies. And Israel lost 30,000 men in that day because we forsook the Lord. Let's go to 1 Samuel 5. Let's go up. We got to go up to the top. 1 Samuel 5, verse 1. And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon, a pagan idol, a fish god. So these Philistines are bugged out. 1 Samuel 5 and 3. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, Behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face. To the <coughs> let's read it again. First Samuel five and three. And when they of let's go back up to verse two. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon, and set it by Dagon. So they had some nerve to sit the ark of the covenant, the ark of the Most High by a pagan god. So this is further proof the other nations have nothing to do with the covenant of the Lord. They are idolatrous by nature, these heathens. Verse 3, And when they of Ashdod arose early in the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth, before the ark of the Lord, and they took Dagon and set him in his place again, still erecting their idols. But the spirit of the Lord was knocking down their idols. And when they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord and the head of Dagon and both the psalms and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. So the spirit of the Most High smote Dagon, this pagan god. And when they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any that came into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod unto this day. So this is showing you, you cannot mix purity with idolatry. So the Most High and His covenant is not to be mixed or intermingled with false worship. Matter of fact, let's go to, um, and it's only intended for his people. Let's go to um, Psalms 50 and 16. Psalms 50 or 16. The book of Psalms, chapter 50, verse 16. But unto the wicked, God saith, what hast thou to do to declare my statutes or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? So the Ark of the Covenant 
is a representation of the contract with Israel only. Now, this wicked is talking about the Edomites and also can apply to the other nations that's following after the Edomites or the other heathens. But unto the wicked, God saith, what hast thou to do to declare my statutes or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth, seeing thou hatest instruction and casteth thy words behind thee and casteth my words behind thee. So his word, his agreement only dwells within his people. First Samuel five or six. But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them and smote them with emrods, even Ashdod and the coast thereof. What are emrods? Hemorrhoids in modern terminology. So this word, his covenant, his contract, has no place with the other nations. That's the big so what. And in the movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark, some of you remember that episode where these German soldiers, it was around the World War I time frame, probably 1917. They opened the Ark of the Covenant and they all turned to skeletons. They melted while they stood on their feet. So listen, the elite, they know what's up. So that's why there's great speculation that the Ark of the Covenant is on Mount Sinai. And it's been banned off in restricted no access areas. Let's go back up to verse 6. Notice the hand of the Lord. That's the spirit of Yahweh Shai, the right arm or the right hand of the Lord. <laughs> Verse 6. But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them and smote them with emrods, even Ashdod and the coast thereof. And when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, the ark of the Most High of Israel shall not abide with us. For his hand is sore upon us and upon Dagon our, our God. So what is this showing us? The Most High's word and his covenant, his contract, has no place with the heathen. Let's read that again. 1 Samuel 5, verse 7. And when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, the ark of the God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is sore upon us and upon Dagon our God. They sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines unto them, and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be carried about unto Goth. And they carried the ark of the Most High of Israel about thither. Get this thing out of here. <laughs> so the Most High has nothing to do with these other nations. He says that they are nothing unto him. Matter of fact, let's go to Isaiah 40, verse 15. See? Isaiah 40, verse 15. Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the ballots. Behold, he taketh up the owls as a very little thing. 
Let's go down to verse 16. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. See? So when you try to take the Most High's covenant, you take on a curse. And this is the takeaway. 1 Samuel 5, verse 8. They sit therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines unto them and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be carried about into Gath. And they carried the ark of the God of Israel about thither. Now Gath is where uh, Goliath came out of. He was a, a big warrior. And Gath means oil press. So he was a well-seasoned warrior of the Philistines that King David took down in the name of the Lord. Yahweh Bashem, Yahweh Shai. Let's go down to verse 9. And it was so that after they had carried it about, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he smote the men of the city, both small and great. They had embrods in their secret parts. So the Most High gave them but hemorrhoids. So this is, I thought God loves everybody. And we're all equal. Where is this God that loves everybody? I thought his covenant or his agreement was with all nations. So this is why we got to study this Bible. So we're reading about a great and terrible power that we serve. The God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let's keep going. 1 Samuel 5, verse 9. And it was so that after they had carried it about, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he smote the men of the city, both small and great, and they had emrods in their secret parts. That's enough there. So the Most High's tabernacle dwells with Jacob, the Israelites. Let's go to Jeremiah 3, verse 16. Let's go to verse 16. And it shall come to pass when ye be multiplied and increased in the land. In those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more. The ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind. Neither shall they remember it. Neither shall they visit it. Neither shall that be done anymore. Why, Lord? Verse 17. At that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it to the name of the Lord. To Jerusalem shall they walk any more. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their heart. So the tabernacle of the Lord is going to be with men, with the house of David. And Yahweh Shai is going to occupy the throne of David, pursuant to Jeremiah 23, verse 5. Let's read that again. Verse 17. At that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. See, 
So let's go to one of my favorites, Joel. Why? Because the Ark of the Covenant is going to be in the midst of Israel. Let's go to Joel 2 and 27. The book of Joel chapter 2, verse 27. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord, your God, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. So this is the Ark of the Covenant. Yahweh Shai is going to dwell in the tabernacle of David. He's going to occupy the throne of rulership on earth forevermore. Let's read that again. Joel 2, verse 27. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord, your God, and none else. And, and my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. So all nations are getting visions, seeing terrible nightmares, and the servants of the Lord, his people. But all the, even the heathen are getting visions in these last days. Let's keep going. So the tabernacle of the Lord is going to be with men. And we read that in uh, Revelations 21, somewhere around verse 3. So what is that tabernacle? Let's go to Psalms 89, verse 22. Let's go up to verse 20. I have found David, my servant, with my holy oil have I anointed him with whom my hand shall be established. My arm also shall strengthen him, the spirit of Yahweh Shai, the spirit of Yahweh by Hashem Yahweh Shai. Verse 22, the enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. Well, the Most High is going to subdue all the heathen and Gentile nations as in the days of old where the angel of the Lord went before us. That's Yahweh Shai. He's in the midst of Israel. So when we had the Ark of the Covenant and the Levitical priests, tribe of Levi, were the custodial managers of the Ark of the Covenant. So that Ark of the Covenant moved with us in battle. And all these nations were defeated. Psalms 89 verse 22. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. Only a Jake talks like that getting beat down. So the Most High says he's going to beat them down. Them who? The other nations. Read Psalms 83, verse 23. And I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him and in my name shall his horn be exalted. What is that mercy seat that we read about earlier? Leviticus 16, verse 14. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it 
with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. What is that? So the spirit of Yahweh Bashim Yahweh Shai is in the Ark of the Covenant or the agreement with Israel, the house or his temple, his tabernacle. Let's read it again because I kind of stumbled. Verse 14. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. So this mercy seat is through the horn of our salvation. See? Let's go up to uh, verse 13. Thou has a mighty arm, strong is thy hand, and high is thy right hand. So we read about that hand of the Ark of the Covenant, which is Yahweh Shai. Do we read that at? See, let's go to uh, right here. First Samuel 5, verse 6. But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them and smote them with emrods, even Ashdod and the coast thereof. So that is the angel of the Lord, Yahweh Shai. Psalms 89, verse 13. Thou hast a mighty arm, strong is thy hand, and high is thy right hand. So that's the horn of our salvation, Yahweh Shai. Let's go back to verse 24. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. And I will set his hand also in the sea, and his right hand in the rivers. See? So he's going to dwell in the midst of his holy tabernacle, starting with his elect. Let's close out here. Psalms 105. So the Ark of the Covenant, let's see who it only pertains to. Is it to the other nations? Tyre and Zidon, the Philistines, Ammon, Amalek, Ishmael, Moab, Esau. Let's see. Ark of the Covenant. Psalms 105, verse 6. O ye seed of Abraham, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath with Isaac and confirm the same unto Jacob for a law and to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying unto thee, I will give the land of Canaan the lot of your inheritance. So the Philistines got to give up their land. So what is this telling us? That the Most High is faithful. Why you think he knocked down the pagan, idolatrous god, Dagon. He's showing you that he is faithful. We the ones committed spiritual fornication. 
idolatry and went off. See that? That's what he's showing us here. That he is faithful. See, where do we read that? Let's go to 1 Samuel 5 and 3. Verse 2. They had a nerve to sit the Ark of the Covenant by their pagan idolatrous god Dagon of the Philistines. The filthy, filthy Philistines. 1 Samuel 5 and 2. When the Philistines took the Ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. And when they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. So the Most High is showing us that his marriage contract, his agreement, his mercy, and his truth endure forever. And his covenant, his marriage agreement, he will never make void or nullify his contract with Israel. Let's go to Jeremiah 3, somewhere around verse 14. See? Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. So he's married. Let's go down to verse 20. See? Surely as a wife treacherously departed from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. See that? So he didn't commit spiritual fornication, breach of contract. We did that. Raised up a golden calf. Worship the false gods of the other nations. The Most High is faithful. Jeremiah 3, verse 20. Surely as a wife treacherously departed from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. Hey, Deuteronomy 7, verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is the most high, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keepeth his commandments to a thousand generations. Wow. That's the Ark of the Covenant with Jacob. Israel, his people, we breached the contract, the marriage agreement, not the most high. Let's read that again. My goodness gracious. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 7, let's go up to verse 6. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because ye were more in number than any people for ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which ye have sworn unto your fathers hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So he brought us out with the spirit of the angel of the Lord. That's Yahweh Shai. Verse 9. Know therefore 
that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful power, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. What commandments? The marriage contract, the agreement made in blood. Why you think Moses sprinkled blood over the congregation of Israel? So we are married unto him by blood. So this went longer than I intended it to. The Ark of the Covenant, his agreement, is with the tabernacle of David, followed by the remnant of the hopeful elect of the house of Israel. His people. There's a description again. And again, I believe this is in uh, Mount Sinai where the Saudi Arabians have put up a security gate saying do not enter. And they've made it off limits. Because those that go in, they get put to death by spiritual forces that are unexplainable. So you go in, but you don't come out. So the other nations know the truth. So hopefully this has been an edifying lesson. We got next, Lord willing, Barack Thumb, Kwame Yisrael, and the Baal. See you on the next lesson, Lord willing. Shalom.